Occasionally, I'll hear a speaker or a preacher ask this question, will you leave a legacy when you die? Y'all ever heard that question? Yeah, and I think that's the wrong question. And every time I hear that, I immediately think, yeah, you're going to leave a legacy. The question is, what legacy are you going to leave? And so I really believe that the better question we can ask is this, what kind of legacy will I leave? Because you are going to leave a legacy. That ought to excite some of you. It ought to cause some of you to have a little uncomfortable feeling because we will all leave a legacy and we will all leave an effect on people. Maybe that's a lot of people that will remember you. Maybe that's just a few people that will remember you. But the question is, how will you be remembered? All right, I want to give you just an opportunity to do a little self-evaluation on the kind of legacy <clears throat> that you're forging right now. So ask yourself, what are my priorities? Where does my time go? Where does my energy go? Where does my creativity go? Where do my resources go? Because where you put your priorities shows the legacy that you're forging. In other words, what are you leading into as you go through this life? And so that's an important question. And, and I want to give you a couple of examples to think about. Let's say you want to leave the legacy of Christian faith for your family. But all of your time and your energy and your resources go into career and hobbies that's probably not the legacy that you're going to leave. And I'm always amazed by Father's Day compared to Mother's Day that Mother's Day is our second biggest Sunday behind Easter. Always is. Father's Day, just another Sunday. And I wonder why that is because the men who are supposed to be leading their families are typically leading them off to the lake because that's what they want to do. And yet they say they want to leave a legacy of Christian faith. Maybe you say you want to leave a legacy of joy and gratitude. But man, you spend a lot of your time thinking about things you wish were different in your life and the things that haven't gone the way you hoped they would. And you talk to other people about the things that are wrong in your life. That's probably not the legacy that you're going to leave. If you want to leave the legacy of positivity and encouragement, and yet you spend a whole lot of time thinking about and talking about the way other people have let you down, all the ways they've messed you up and don't treat you the way you think you should be treated, that's probably not the legacy you're going to leave. What legacy are you creating now by the way you live? See, this life won't last forever, and so you need to think about that before it's too late. Well, if you have your Bibles or your Bible apps, go ahead and open those up to the book of Ruth in the Old Testament. We're going to work our way through all four chapters of this, what I think is such a beautiful story about legacy. Ruth left an incredible legacy on the world. It was a legacy that's big enough that we're still talking about her over 3,000 years after her life ended. And it's even bigger than that because her legacy will continue all the way into eternity. And so my hope and my prayer for you as you hear about this beautiful story of Ruth and Boaz, that you'll be challenged and inspired to change the legacy that you're forging in this life so that you can leave a dynamic and lasting legacy as a follower of Christ in the world around you. Well, if you're familiar with the, the story of Ruth, you may be wondering why in the world I picked preaching about a woman on Father's Day. I get it's a little, out, a little unusual, a little out of the normal. And, and look, there are lots of dudes that I could have talked about on Father's Day. I, I considered preaching on Moses. But then I think about it, Moses was called by God in this crazy way. I mean, he's there and he hears the voice of God coming out of a burning bush that's not burning up. That's going to get your attention, especially if it's coming from a shrubbery. And that's not the way most of us are called. I, I thought about talking about Paul because he left an amazing legacy on the world. A third of the New Testament was written by the Apostle Paul. The spread of Christianity was a big part due to Paul's life. And yet he was called when he was walking down the road to Damascus and Jesus miraculously appears to him and strikes him blind. That got his attention. I, I thought about King David. But King David was called when a famous uh, prophet shows up at his farm and, and pours oil all over his head and says, you're going to be the next king of Israel. Well, that's another pretty dynamic calling that he had. But usually the calling for us is a lot more subtle, and it usually doesn't involve a shrubbery. And so I wanted to have a story that looks a little more like our calling. Because I want you to see in Ruth's story that the calling 
was a subtle call of God. It was just the quiet urgings of the Holy Spirit in a strong sense that she needed to make some decisions to follow God. But I don't want you to mistake a subtle calling with one that's not important. Because the impact that Ruth will have on eternity is amazing. She has left an incredible legacy. And it's as profound as some of these other more dramatic callings that we've looked at. I also want you to see in the story of Ruth that there's not this one moment where God says out of a burning bush, here's what you will do. Instead, it's a series of decisions that she made, commitments that she makes as she goes through her life, little things that don't look that important in the moment, but ultimately cause her to have a profound life. And it often works the same way for us. There's a cumulative effect of all the little decisions, all the decisions we make to follow God and to be obedient to his call that ultimately give us a life of legacy. All right. Now, the book of Ruth, it doesn't start out happy. It doesn't start out with with legacy. It starts out with tragedy and hardship and difficulty. We see that there was a man named Elimelech who lived with Naomi and two sons in the city of Bethlehem. And the city of Bethlehem was a very much an agricultural center. Lots of crops came out of the city of Bethlehem. In, in fact, the city of Bethlehem in, in uh, Hebrew means the house of bread because it was this amazing place where grain was grown. But at this point, there's famine. God had allowed famine to come into the country because Israel had been disobedient. And Elimelech decides that he's not going to honor and trust God by continuing to allow God to take care of him in this difficult season. So he takes his wife, Naomi, and their two sons, and he leaves the country entirely. And he heads out to a country called Moab. But unfortunately, tragedy follows them to Moab in this disobedience. And so Elimelech dies. So now Naomi is there without a husband and just her two sons. Eventually, her two sons would marry Moabite women. Well, that was disobedience to God because the Jewish people were told not to marry into the surrounding nations because of their pagan religion, and they, didn't want, they wanted Israel to stay true to the one true God, but they do it anyway. After they get married, both sons now die, so we have more tragedy. And, and so you can see Naomi's now left, no husband, no sons, and she's living with these two Moabite widows. As you can imagine, Naomi's devastated by what's happened in her life up to this point, and she decides to return home to Bethlehem. And in verses 8 and 9 of chapter 1, Naomi says goodbye to her two daughters-in-law. Let's look at that. Go back, each of you, to your mother's home. May the Lord show you kindness as you have shown kindness to your dead husbands and to me. May the Lord grant that each of you will find rest in the home of another husband. So Naomi tells them, go back to your, your homes where you can be taken care of. Both of them protest. They don't want to leave Naomi. But Naomi says, look, if you go with me back to Israel, you're probably never going to get married. You're probably never going to have a family of your own. And so one of these uh, daughters-in-law cheerfully goes back and leaves Naomi. But the other one named Ruth says, that's not what I'm going to do. Look at what Ruth says in verses 16 through 18. But Ruth replied, don't urge me to leave you or to go back, turn back from you. Where you go, I will go. And where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people, and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if even death separates you and me. When Naomi realized that Ruth was determined to go with her, she stops urging her. I love what Ruth says here. Ruth says, Naomi, I'm with you. Your people, my people. Your place, my place. Your God, my God. And so in this moment, She is following this subtle call on her life. She is deciding to leave the idols and the the gods of her homeland and follow the one true God. Now, I want you to notice here, there's no bright light from heaven. There's no burning bush. There's no voice that shakes the mountains. There's just this quiet urging of the Holy Spirit. But understand what Ruth's doing here. Ruth is leaving everything she knows. She's leaving her family because it was clear she had a family to go back to. She's leaving the ways she knows, the customs, the traditions. She's going with a mother-in-law back to a place where her aging mother-in-law may not be able to take care of herself, much less be able to take care of Ruth. She's leaving her culture and her country behind. She's also leaving her pagan gods behind. In this moment, 
Ruth is committing to follow the one true God, the God of Israel. But she's leaving everything that brought her comfort, everything that brought her security. This wasn't easy, but this was God's plan for her. And so the first thing we learn from this story of Ruth is that lasting legacy is found outside our comfort zone. God's not calling you to stay in your comfortable, secure little life where you look out only for you. He is calling you to leave a legacy that makes a difference. You're being called to take some risk, to change the lives of the people around you, to leave a legacy of faith in your family, to leave a legacy in your church, to leave a legacy in your community that has a dynamic impact in the kingdom of God. (laughs) I can't tell you how many times I've heard Christians tell me about something they felt called to do But then a little later, they'll back out of that calling because it was harder than they thought. And they'll say these words that make me laugh every time. If it was God's will, it'd be easy. And they talk just like that when they say it. And I'm thinking, where in the Bible does it say that? My Bible doesn't say that. Maybe they've got a special Bible, the Bible for lazy people, but my Bible doesn't say that. In fact, if you looked at every life in the Bible that where a legacy of faith was left, It generally wasn't easy at all. Think about Jesus. The legacy Jesus left was the cross. And that was tough. There was nothing easy about that. He did not go to the cross because it was easy. He went to the cross because that was what he was called to do. It's what he came to do. Think about the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul left an incredible legacy on the world. But was his life easy? No. That dude was shipwrecked. He was bitten by poisonous snakes. He was beaten with rods. He was beaten with whips. He was jailed. He was cursed. He was left for dead. He was stoned. And ultimately, he was killed for sharing his faith. That doesn't sound very easy to me. God didn't call Paul to a life of comfort and convenience. He called Paul to leave an incredible legacy that would last 2,000 years and into eternity. And if you take a look at the story of the other apostles, the other early Christians... There was nothing comfortable or easy about that. And so I think we make this mistake of saying if it's God's will, it's going to be easy because it's not. God is calling every single one of us to something. It's different. Maybe it's to share your faith with somebody at work or somebody in your family. Maybe it's to start inviting more people to church with you. Maybe he's calling you to be more active in serving on Sunday mornings in our children's ministry, our tech ministry. Maybe it's even up here if you've got the talent for it. I don't. Maybe you do. Maybe he's calling you to that. Maybe he's calling you to be more generous with your finances, even though that makes you feel very uncomfortable and even though it it worries you about the effect. Maybe some of you he's calling into full-time ministry or to mission work. I don't know what he's calling you to, but I know that he's calling you. He's calling us always to take a step of faith, to get out of our comfort zone, to take a little risk to serve him because he wants us to love him enough to do that. And so we're called to show intentional grace to other people around us even when it's not easy. A lot of you guys know my story. I was called to be a preacher early in high school and it was not this, you know, God didn't talk to me out of a tomato plant in my parents' garden. Uh, Just this feeling that that's what I was supposed to do that became more and more significant over time. Now, for me, my history held this calling back a little bit because uh, if you've heard it before, my dad was a dynamic young preacher who was killed in a private plane crash when I was eight. And so all the women in my church would, old ladies, they'd come up to me and they'd pinch my cheek and they'd say, you're going to carry on your dad's legacy by being a preacher. And so for a little while, I wondered if my calling was God, or it was just nightmares of little old ladies chasing me around, pinching my cheeks, and telling me what I was going to do. But by the time I graduated from high school, I was pretty confident that I was called to preach, to, to share God's message. But as I went through college, I decided to run from God and to run from that calling. And so I spent 20 years running from that calling and running from God. And God, the amazing thing is he blessed me throughout that. I became a pretty successful lawyer. I've made a good amount of money. God has blessed us financially and with success in my career. But the calling wasn't done. So he eventually decided to get my attention, and so my wife's diagnosis of lupus reminded me of what was more important than my career. And so we began to grow closer as a family, but we also began to grow closer back to God. And so we got engaged in church again. 
And as I got engaged in church very regularly and began serving and praying regularly and my relationship grew, I began to feel this call to preach again. And, and let me be honest, I was not excited about this call because at that point I was 40 years old. I had a very successful career. I had a big family. God was providing a financially successful career for my family. I also had 30 employees that worked for me that I had to take care of. And so I thought about all of those things, but I also thought, I'm too old. I don't have any experience in ministry. I don't have any training. I don't have any education in that. I don't even know if a church would be interested in a 40-year-old pastor that doesn't have any experience. And so I, when I began to talk to other people about maybe making this decision, it was amazing to me that so many people tried to discourage me. Even Christian people tried to discourage me. I remember the church we were in, one of the elders told me, you know, maybe God's just calling you to like teach Sunday school more or to do a little more, be a little more active in the church. You know, you're already having a big impact in this church by giving financially and tithing and by the way you're leading some of the ministry in this church. He was trying to protect me from myself by keeping me in my comfort zone. But that's not where God wanted me. God didn't want me to find legacy in my comfort zone. He wanted me to get out of my comfort zone. God may not be calling you into vocational ministry, but he is calling every single one of us to take a next step. What is the next step? Listen to how the uh, Apostle Peter says this in 1 Peter 4, 10 through 11. He says, each of you should use whatever gifts you've received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. If anyone speaks, they should do so as one who speaks the very words of God. If anyone serves, they should go do so with the strength God provides so that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To him be the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. Peter here is saying, each of you. Now, if you go back and you look at the Greek translation, the Greek translation of each of you means Every one of you, each of you. That's why it's translated that way. He wasn't getting ready for a pastor's conference to where he was going to speak to pastors. That's not his notes. He is talking to every single Christian saying, we are to be the church. We're to get out of our comfort zone to show intentional grace to others. God is constantly calling us to take little steps of faith, to do new things and different things that stretch us in our faith. And sometimes he calls us to big things that require big changes and sacrifice. We're each called to leave a godly legacy in our family, in our church, and in our community around us. And often these aren't easy. God is stretching us. He's pulling us out of our faith because he wants us to grow in relationship with him and he wants us to make an impact on the world around us. If you aren't hearing God's call on your life for something, can I challenge you a little bit? It's probably because you aren't listening. Most of us do not get the blessing of a burning bush. What we get is the quiet urging of the Holy Spirit, and so we've got to listen for that. All right, let's get back to the story of Ruth here. At the end of chapter 1, Naomi and Ruth return to Bethlehem just as the harvest season for barley is starting. And so Ruth says that she is going to go out and try to find some food, and she is going to go walk behind the harvesters of the barley and gather grain and just pick it up and take it home. Now, when we hear that, we may think that, that Ruth was setting herself up to be arrested for trespassing and for theft, but, but that, wasn't, that wasn't how it worked. The law actually allowed for this. And in fact, Jewish law required that a farmer was well, not too diligent when he was harvesting his crops, that he'd let a little fall here and there so that poor people could come along behind and gather grain to survive. In fact, the, the law was so clear that if a harvester dropped a big bundle of grain, he had to leave it, couldn't pick it up so that someone that needed it could come along behind. So Ruth goes out into the barley field, and we see here what I'll call divine coincidences. We have all these little coincidences in our life, and so often we have a tendency to kind of chalk those up to just, uh, it's just a random coincidence. But so often, if we really pay attention, it's God being active and working in our life, and that's what we see here. Look at Ruth 2, 3 through 4. So she went out, entered a field, and began to glean behind the harvesters. As it turned out, in other words, just coincidentally, she was working in a field belonging to Boaz, who was from the clan of Elimelech, that's her dead father-in-law. Just then, Boaz arrived from Bethlehem and greeted the harvesters. The Lord be with you, the Lord bless you, they answered. So we see this little moment that is filled with divine coincidences. She goes to a random field, but, but it just happened to be the field of her wealthy uh, uh, the 
brother of her dead father-in-law. And he just happens to show up at that point to check on his fields. He just happens to notice Ruth in the field. He just happens to take an interest in her. Now, there's no indication here that he had any romantic interest in Ruth. But when he finds out that she is in the clan or the same family as he is, and she's the the daughter-in-law of Elimelech, he tells her, he says, man, you come back to these fields every day. You come, you glean here, and we'll take good care of you. And then he tells his workers, when Ruth is here, you drop a little extra, and you make sure she's safe. So when Ruth goes home that evening, she's gathered 30 pounds of barley, which I'm assuming is more than you would normally get when you glean a field like that. And she tells Naomi Naomi, that she met their relative Boaz. Look at how Naomi responds in verse 20. It says, the Lord bless him, Naomi said to her daughter-in-law. He has not stopped showing his kindness to the living and the dead. She added, that man is our close relative. He is one of our guardian redeemers. Now this Guardian Redeemer is going to play an important role in this story of Ruth. A Guardian Redeemer is also sometimes called a Kinsman Redeemer. But in the Hebrew language, the Guardian Redeemer looks like this. It was called Gael. And Gael was a close relative who had the right and the obligation to take care of his close relatives. So in this circumstance, he had the right to now go buy back the land that Elimelech had abandoned. He also had the right to marry Ruth and the duty to marry Ruth. And this law was in place to make sure that a young widow had a family of her own, that she could eventually have kids. So Ruth keeps going to Boaz's fields. She gathers barley, and then when wheat season comes, she then gathers wheat. And so we see God taking care of her. Ruth doesn't get a divine calling that's this, you know, burning bush, the mountain shaking. What she gets is divine confirmation of that the decision she made was right because God is taking care of her. And I think that's how it works for us. I know that's how it works for me. I just get the subtle urgings of the Holy Spirit. But then God shows up and takes care of me, and he honors my willingness to serve this call on her life. We don't know how long Ruth continues to go out to the field. We know it was at least a year because it's at least the next part of the story takes place during the barley season, but it was probably several years uh, before this happens. And Naomi, her mother-in-law, starts to realize that Boaz has some feelings for Ruth at this point that are more than just, you know, family concern and friendship, that maybe he has an interest in her uh, to be a romantic relationship. And so she gives Ruth some advice that's going to sound a little weird to us, and it sounded a little weird to Ruth as well. Look at what Naomi says to Ruth in chapter 3. Verses 1 through 4. One day, Ruth's mother-in-law, Naomi, said to her, My daughter, I must find a home for you, where you will be well provided for. Now Boaz, with whom women you have worked, is a relative of ours. Tonight he'll be winnowing barley on the threshing floor. Wash, put on perfume, and get dressed in your best clothes. Then go down to the threshing floor. But don't let him know you're there until he's finished eating and drinking. When he lies down, note the place where he is lying. Then go and uncover his feet and lie down. He will tell you what to do. Well, now, if we don't know the custom, that sounds a little awkward, a little intimate, maybe a little inappropriate, but that's not what's happening. This was something that was a part of Jewish tradition. So she was actually revealing herself to uh, Boaz as a servant, because often the servants would lie at their master's feet in case the master needed anything during the night. But the tradition of she would pull the covers back off his feet just a little bit and lie down in that spot She was also making it clear that she was asking for him to be her guardian redeemer and to take care of her and to protect her and even to consider marrying her and taking her into his own family. And then what would happen is if the guardian redeemer took the blanket and covered her up, that was him indicating that he was accepting that responsibility. And so we see this really odd thing going on here that feels a little uncomfortable to us. Felt a little uncomfortable to Ruth, too. It was unexpected. But despite the fact that she didn't fully understand, look how Ruth responds in verses 5 through 6. She says, Naomi, I'll do whatever you say, Ruth answered. So she went down to the threshing floor and did everything her mother-in-law told her to do. So she goes down, she lays at his feet, she uncovers the blanket and lays in that spot, and she is indicating that she is asking him to be her guardian redeemer. 
This was uncomfortable for her. It didn't feel right because she came from a foreign country with different laws and custom. But despite that, she does exactly what she was called to do. So the next thing that we learn about lasting legacy, first learn that lasting legacy is out, found outside your comfort zone. Next thing we learn is that lasting legacy is found in the unexpected. When I left my last church ministry, I was pretty confident I was done as a pastor. I was a little disillusioned. I was disappointed. And Lil and I were both absolutely convinced that we were done with formal ministry. A few months after that ministry, we had a conversation and we said, we will never be back in formal ministry in a church. That was our expectation. Obviously, we were wrong. God allowed me about a year and a half to kind of heal, to recuperate and get ready. And then he began to call me, not just to go back into ministry, but to plant a church. Now, let me be clear. If going into ministry in an established church at 40 made no sense, starting a church at 52 <laughs> made no sense. It seemed crazy to me. I, I'd never been a lead pastor. I had no idea how to plan a church. I didn't know how to do musical worship. I didn't know that we'd have a place to even meet. I didn't know if anybody would show up if we actually started a church. And, and so it was unexpected. So I told my wife about what I felt like God was calling. And I told her about this unexpected call. And it took me about a month and a half to accept it because I really didn't want to. It only took my wife about two weeks to say, if you're in, I'm in. I guess her faith is stronger than my faith. I didn't understand this unexpected call at the time. But as I look back three and a half years later after my call, like, I'm blown away by what God has done. I've seen Jesus put broken marriages back together. Addictions get overcome. Family relationships restored. Depression defeated. Attitudes completely turned upside down. Relationships deepen and grow. I'm blown away by how you guys care for one another and how you serve the community and what I get to see this church do. But even bigger than that, I get a front row seat to watch people follow Jesus. Whether you, I don't know if you realize this or not, but in the short three years we've been in church, we've already baptized 45 people, which is crazy for a plant. And every year that number goes up that we baptize. I can see God's plan unfolding. Now, let me be real clear. I would have liked God to have told me all of this back at the time, three and a half years ago when he called me, to give me a little, hey, here's what I'm going to do. But that's not the way God generally works. He calls us out of our comfort zone. He calls us into the unexpected, and then he begins to confirm that calling when we see things play out. And, and so as I see this church thrive and grow and love one another, it's a divine confirmation of that calling. All right, so when Boaz discovers Ruth lying at his feet, he doesn't immediately cover her up with the blanket because there's a little problem. There's a little, I guess, wrinkle in our love story. So he tells Ruth that, uh, that he would be happy to be her guardian redeemer. He would love to marry her and to take her into his family. But unfortunately, there's actually a closer relative. That Boaz is a close relative, but there's one guy that's closer, and he has the first right under Jewish law to buy back uh, the land of Elimelech and, and to marry Ruth. And so he says, look, if this guy doesn't do it, I'm in. I'm ready. But we got to figure that out. And then in Ruth chapter 4, we see the end of this story. So... Uh, Boaz calls this closer relative to the city gates where all the elders sit and make decisions. And there was probably a crowd there that would watch the elders uh, debate and talk about what to do. And so he calls this closer relative and he says, look, you're the guardian redeemer in this circumstance. And you've got the right to buy the land of Elimelech back. And this dude immediately says, I'm in. I'll do it. Now, this wasn't a big sacrifice for this guy because he was always willing to take more land into his family. And, I, and I'm sure if Ruth and, Boaz, I mean Ruth and Naomi were in the crowd, I'm sure their hearts dropped with disappointment as they saw this. But Boaz wasn't done. Boaz had a plan. So Boaz said, you know, so there's also this little issue of you got to take the, the daughter-in-law of Elimelech into your family. And you got to marry her. I, I think he waited till the very end to kind of catch this guy off guard so he didn't have a time to process, how's this new wife going to affect my family? How's it going to affect the inheritance of my grown sons? And now, this isn't in the Bible, but I think, I like to think that Boaz also gave a little description of Ruth that, you know, unfortunately she's, she's not Jewish, but man, she has a great personality. 
<laughs> and the guy goes, no, I, I think I'm out. And Boaz said, then I got this immediately. He's no dummy. Here's how the story ends in Ruth 4, 13 through 17. So Boaz took Ruth and she became his wife. When he made love to her, the Lord enabled her to conceive and she gave birth to a son. The woman said to Naomi, praise be to the Lord who this day has not left you without a guardian redeemer. May he become famous throughout Israel. He will renew your life and sustain you in your old age. For your daughter-in-law who loves you and who is better to you than seven sons has given him birth. Then Naomi took the child in her arms and cared for him. The women living there said, Naomi has a son, and they named him Obed. He was the father of Jesse, the father of David. So Boaz and Ruth, they have a son named Obed. He had a son named Jesse who had a son named David. Now this is not just some random dude named David. This was the great king of Israel, King David. But Ruth's legacy was even bigger than that. Ruth was not only the great-grandmother of a great king, she was in the lineage of the king of kings because Jesus was born from the line of David. You remember that when they gave birth to Jesus, Mary and Joseph had to go back to Bethlehem, the home of their family. They went back to Bethlehem because that was where David, King David was from. But originally, that's where Ruth and Boaz lived. In that place, Ruth created this incredible legacy through her obedience to God's call in her life. Ruth didn't get a single call from God through this amazing thing. She just made a series of decisions that left her with a life of legacy. And Ruth and her legacy will last into eternity. The story of of Ruth is this true historical account of the lineage of Jesus. But it's also this beautiful picture of how God works in our life because Jesus is our guardian redeemer. Listen to what the prophet Isaiah wrote in Isaiah 54, 4 through 8. He says, do not be afraid. You will not be put to shame. Do not fear disgrace. You will not be humiliated. You will forget the shame of your youth and remember no more the reproach of your widowhood. For your maker is your husband. The Lord Almighty is his name. The Holy One of Israel is your redeemer. There's that word. He is called the God of all the earth. The Lord will call you back as if you were a wife deserted and distressed in spirit, a wife who married young only to be rejected, says your God. For a brief moment, I abandon you, but with deep compassion, I will bring you back. In a surge of anger, I hid my face from you for a moment, but with everlasting kindness, I will have compassion on you, says the Lord, your Redeemer. The word Redeemer here is that same Hebrew word, Gael that was talking about Boaz being the guardian redeemer of Ruth. And we see this beautiful parallel between the story of Boaz and Ruth and our story with Jesus. Just like Boaz was a relative of Ruth and he took her into the family, Jesus left heaven, became like us so that he could be a part of our family so eventually we could be a part of his family. And we see too that Ruth was an outsider. She was a Moabite. And yet she was adopted into the family of God. The Bible's very clear that we, before we follow Jesus, are outsiders. But Jesus adopts us into the family of God and we become part of his family. We see how Boaz took the actions that he took to be her guardian redeemer because of his great love for Ruth. And we see this parallel. Jesus loved you so much that he went to the cross and suffered and died so that he could redeem you. We see that the way... Boaz redeemed Ruth was by making her his wife. And how does the Bible talk about our relationship with Jesus? It calls the church the bride of Christ. And so we see these beautiful connections and this beautiful picture of God's incredible love for us. But make no mistake, for this to happen, Ruth left behind everything she knew, everything that was comfortable and convenient to follow God's subtle call on her life. And because she did this, She's left a legacy that will last forever. It would lead to the birth of Jesus who would redeem all mankind from sin and death. In in this beautiful story, we learn that lasting legacy is found outside our comfort zone. Lasting legacy is found in the unexpected. And finally, lasting legacy is found in obedience. Before I answered God's call to be a preacher, I was headed towards a legacy of being a really good attorney, making lots of money, having lots of success. But I would have also left the legacy of being just an okay dad, 
an okay husband who cared way more about his career than he did about anything else. But because I was finally obedient to God, that legacy is changing. I'm no longer going to leave that legacy because that's not the legacy I want to leave. When I was called to preach and then called to plant this church, my legacy is shaking me up to be very different. There'll be people in heaven because I left my comfort zone, because I embraced the unexpected, and because I was obedient to God's call. I regularly run into people who I've baptized or I've done their wedding or I've done a funeral for someone that they care about. Sometimes I know those people. Sometimes I don't even remember who they are. But I've played a little part in their life, and I've played a part in their eternity. The Apostle Paul, he calls the people that have followed Jesus through his ministry, he calls them his crown of joy, both here and in heaven. And I'm starting to understand what Paul was talking about because there's this incredible joy of knowing that somebody's eternity has changed because of a little part you play. And it's actually even bigger than that. If you think about the legacy, if a man or a woman decides to follow Jesus, what happens? They have a Christian home, and their kids may decide to follow Jesus, and their grandkids may decide to follow Jesus, and so on. And so it becomes a generational legacy that takes place. And that's happened because I decided to put more focus and energy and time into Jesus and his church. I wasn't called to leave a legacy by a burning bush or by a vision of Jesus walking down I-10, but God has confirmed my calling over and over again. My legacy is changing. This church is now part of my legacy. People will remember, remember me in heaven for the part I played in their life. The Bible's clear about that. It'll all say I will, that I will remember them and I'll know who they are. And I don't say that to brag, because I certainly waited 20 years before I was obedient. I say that so that you can see what's in front of you, so that you can see that it's not too late to change your legacy that you're leaving. So let's go back to the question I showed you at the very beginning. What kind of legacy will I leave? I challenge you to think about that. I, I, let me use the vernacular of my East Texas rural upbringing. I double dog dare you to think about that question. How will you be remembered when this life is over? What impact will your life make in eternity? Is the legacy you're currently forging what God's calling you to, or is it just pretty much a legacy about taking care of yourself? What legacy are you being called to by God? What's the legacy you're being called to leave in your family, in this church, and in this community? What needs to happen? What priorities need to change to reshape your life so that you can leave that kind of legacy? Like, I don't know exactly what legacy you're being called to, but I do know you're being called. And the real question you have to ask is, will you answer? Let's pray.